Amen. We'll be preaching today from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And the scripture reads as follows. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I won't be before you long today, uh, but I do want to share a word with you uh, entitled Mary on disposition before duty. Mary on disposition before duty. For the past few weeks, we have been exploring the subject of divine encounter or divine visitation. The seasons of Advent and Christmas are fundamentally about divine visitation, about the various ways in which God enters the human realm with a message of good news. One of the conclusions that we drew was that God visits us in extraordinary ways when we are given to the ordinary task to which God has called us. Zechariah the priest, for example, was privy to an encounter with the archangel Gabriel as he fulfilled the ordinary role of intercession at the altar of incense. Similarly, Zechariah's promised son, John the Baptist, encountered God while he was engaged in his role as a witness to the light of Jesus Christ. John, in fact, was knee deep in the Jordan River baptizing the multitudes when he was visited by Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By extension, we reason, God visits us when we as disciples fulfill our ordinary roles of witnessing to the light of Jesus Christ and interceding, that is praying to God on behalf of others. In today's scripture, we read about the cousin of John the Baptist, a maid servant named Mary. Unlike John the Baptist and Zechariah, Mary was not engaged in any particular duty when she experienced divine visitation. Mary was neither burning incense at the altar or witnessing to the light when she was visited by the archangel Gabriel, the same divine messenger who appeared to Zechariah. Gabriel, we recall, is the angel who stands in the presence of God and who has the power to announce God's will to humankind. The scripture simply says that Gabriel was sent by God to Mary in the city of Nazareth. There is no record of duties leading up to Mary's divine encounter. So we are led to believe that disposition rather than duty precipitated Mary's visit from the archangel. While the apostle Luke is silent about Mary's duties, he does identify a couple of elements of Mary's disposition, which I believe served as the catalyst for divine encounter. In the first place, Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus, was fearless. 
Fearlessness, we should know, is a central aspect of disposition for every person who is drawn into the narrative of salvation. Fear not was the word spoken by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah before he received the good news of the births of John the Baptist and Jesus the Messiah. Fear not was the word spoken by the angel to the shepherds as they kept watch over their flocks by night. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. To Joseph, Mary's betrothed, the angel of the Lord said, Fear not to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And fear not was the word spoken by the divine messenger to Mary as she pondered the good news that she would give birth to the Savior of the world. To every key person in the unfolding of God's narrative of salvation, God sent a messenger to tell them not to fear. Why? Because fear is a manifestation of doubt. And God cannot accomplish what God wills to in our lives if we doubt. The currency that God deals in is called faith, and without it, it's impossible to please God. So if you're struggling with doubt or fear, as we all do at some point, please know that there is help from heaven. For the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. God, in other words, gives us everything that we need to believe in his message of salvation. Power, love, and a sound mind are resources to help us believe in God's work of salvation. I can only speak for myself here, but I really want to be included in the divine drama of salvation. And in order to do that, I have to cast fear aside. Like Mary, I have to be fearless in the face of the good news that God sent Jesus to save me. The same Jesus suffered and died on a cross, bearing the marks of our iniquity in his own body. The same Jesus was raised in three days as the victor over sin and the grave. And the same Jesus promised to come again to receive unto his own those who love him. Now, in order to embrace a story that is this big into my life, I have to cast aside fear. God's project of salvation is so extraordinary that I need faith to receive it. I don't know who this is for today, but don't let fear abort the message of salvation that God has sent just for you. I encourage you today to receive the good news of salvation in the spirit of faith. Faith is the second element of Mary's disposition. Mary was both fearless and faithed. The reason that I'm focusing on disposition is because we can easily fall into the trap of duty even the duties which God calls us to fulfill. But it's possible to get pulled into a cycle of duties without giving the proper attention to disposition. By the word disposition, I simply mean a person's inherent qualities of mind and character. Mary is a great example of the type of dis disposition that elicits divine visitation, as she was both fearless and faith. And what I like about Mary's faith is that there was room for questions. Some people believe that if you have faith in God, you can't question God. But I believe that there is room in our faith for questions. Personally, I have faith in God. And sometimes I have questions for God. As in God, why am I going through this? God, what does this mean? God, how is this going to work out? God, will this work out? God, when will the situation get better? But my questions do not negate my faith in God any more than Mary's question negated her faith. Questions are not necessarily a sign of faithlessness or fear. Sometimes questions are a call for clarity. <laughs> Mary in today's scripture posed a clarifying question to the angel Gabriel. When Gabriel announced to Mary that she would conceive in her womb and bring forth a son and should call his name Jesus, that he would be great and that of his kingdom there would be no end, Mary asked, how can this be? How can this be since I, since I do not know a man? But notice the trajectory of Mary's faith. 
When the divine messenger informed Mary that the Holy Spirit would accomplish what he had announced, Mary's disposition changed from how can this be to let it be. Let it be to me according to your word. When Mary, when Mary said to the angel, let it be to me according to your word, the angel departed and Mary sealed her destiny as the mother of God. And she did it with her faith. Now, the Bible does not say this, but I believe that when the angel Gabriel departed, he went back to heaven in the presence of God. Gabriel said himself in Luke chapter one, verse 19, I am the one who stands in the presence of God. And in God's presence, Gabriel reported Mary's agreement with God's will for her life, that she would give birth to the anointed one who would usher in a new dispensation of salvation for the world. Now, the reason that this word is important is because somebody like Mary needs to move along the trajectory of faith from how can this be to let it be. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, I know that this is Christmas Eve. I'm aware that we're celebrating the miracle and mystery of God being born among us in Jesus Christ. But we're also celebrating the truth that God, according to his word, can birth something new in us. More than something new, God wants to enact his comprehensive plan of salvation in our lives. A plan that includes our health and our peace, the fulfillment of our hopes and our dreams. God wills to do it, to birth something new in us, but God needs our agreement in faith. So before you open one gift under the Christmas tree, I want you to make up your mind for the last week of this year and for all of next year that the expression of your faith will be, let it be. Let it be. God, let it be to me according to your word. Now, I'm not asking you to demonstrate this type of faith based on a whim. I'm inviting you to exhibit a let it be type of faith based on Luke 1 and 37, which in the NIV version says, no word from God will ever fail. Amen. Listen to me very carefully. Governments fail. <laughs> Businesses fail. Educational institutions fail. Banks fail. Markets fail. People fail. But no word from God will ever fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my words will never pass away. So grab on to the let it be to me according to your word faith, knowing that no word from God will ever fail. And your faith in God's word, my friends, will bring what God has promised to pass. Do you believe it, church? Amen. Before I take my seat today, I, I want you to consider the message from the angel Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. It is a profound message spoken from the throne room of God to the fearless and to the faithed. And since Gabriel's announcement originated in the presence of God, the message is essentially Trinitarian, which is to say that the message accounts for the presence and power of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gabriel's message, in other words, speaks to the fullness of of the Godhead. I, I, I've been meditating on this story, and, and I, I believe that God said, listen, Sean, you, you got to pay attention to what Gabriel's saying. <laughs> Gabriel's not anybody. He's the one that stands in my presence. Are you with me, church? And so his message, what God revealed to me, is that Gabriel's message was not just for Mary. Gabriel's message was for all of humanity. Are you with me, church? He's the one who stands in the presence of God, and he has a special message for the whole world. Are you with me, church? And although Gabriel's word was spoken to Mary, the mother of our Lord, I believe that it applies to every disciple since Mary, who was fearless and faithed as she was. The first revelation spoken by the angel Gabriel to Mary was, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Now, if you're not shouting right now in your spirit, it may be because you have not considered carefully enough what your situation would be like if the Lord was not with you. David, the psalmist, helps us here because he pondered what his reality would be like if the Lord was not with him. 
In Psalm 124, David expressed it this way. If it had not been the Lord who was on my side, when men rose up against us, when they would, they would have swallowed us alive, when their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Now, see, I identify with the psalmist here because I realize that if the Lord was not with me, my enemies would have swallowed me alive a long time time ago. Are you with me, church? Like David, I realized that if the Lord was not with me, the fierce and unpredictable currents of life would have long swept me away. In Psalm 18, the psalmist also offers a snapshot of what it means to have the Lord with him. Are you with me, church? For by you, the psalmist declared, I can crush a troop, and by my God, I can leap over a wall. Without the Lord, the psalmist reasons, my enemies would have swallowed me alive. With the Lord, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. But there's another revelation in Gabriel's word to Mary and to us. Gabriel informs Mary that the Lord was with her even before she conceived. Are you with me, church? So before the promise of the Christ child materialized in Mary's womb, the divine messenger informed Mary that Christ was already with her. A lot of folk are looking for something in the material world, a date on a calendar, trimesters that they can count, an email that they can read to confirm that the Lord is with them. But the Lord, I remind you, has no length of days. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last, the one who was and is and is to come. According to John 1, 1 and 3, all things have come into being through him. So the Lord is with you right now. Are you with me, church? Before the child is conceived, before the business is launched, before the degree program begins, before the house is purchased, know that the Lord is already with you. My God, the Lord is with you. This is a tremendous revelation because the, the angel tells her, listen to me, you're going to give birth to the Christ child. You're going to give birth to the Lord of all, the anointed one, the Messiah. But you don't have to wait till then. You don't have to wait till conception. You don't have to wait till the moment of conception. Some of us are waiting <laughs> I hope y'all get this. I'm preaching for me today. Some of us are waiting for a demonstration of God, and God is saying, I'm already with you. Amen. I've been with you all along. You, you're, 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 you're stressing. You're staying up at night. You're waiting for something to happen. You're waiting for a, for a phone call. You're waiting for a pat on the back from your supervisor. And God says, you're, you're waiting for the moment of conception. But Gabriel told Mary, the Lord is with you right now. Oh my God. I, I, I don't have to wait until the moment of conception. God is with me right now. And if God is with me right now, that means I need to be experiencing the miracle working power of God right now. Are you with me, church? Right now, right now on Christmas Eve, I need to be experiencing the miracle working power. I'm not waiting for Christmas, church. I need God right now. Are you with me, church? Now, I, I want you to take this. I wanted you to take this revelation home with you that that God that God is with you right now. That he's with you right now. And see, God being with us, God being with us, it means everything. My God. It, it means everything. I, I hope you heard what, the, what David was trying to tell us. He said, he said, when God is with me, he said, I can run through a troop, he said. He said, I can leap. Oh, my gosh. He said, essentially, in, in our vernacular, he's saying, I'm like Superman when God is with me. Amen. He said, there's nothing I cannot do when, 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 God, when God is with me. Are you with me, church? And I believe what, we, what Christmas is really about, it's a celebration of the fact that God is with us. Are you with me, church? Amen. That Emmanuel, that God is with that God condescended. My God. He condescended to put on flesh. Are you with me? Jesus left his place in heaven. Are you with me, church? Let's, let's think about it for a moment. Jesus had, he, everything was in order, everything that it was like it's supposed to be in heaven. There's glory, there's love, there's communion, there's power, there's great, everything, there's light. There's, there's no, no night in, in heaven. Are you with me? There's everything. And he condescended to come down to us. Are you with me, church? So what, what I'm trying to tell you is that he's with you now. I don't want you to wait. Listen, 
Some of us are waiting for an event. Listen to me. God is telling us the event has already happened. You're, you're waiting for something in your reality, in the material world, to manifest. And God is saying he's with you right now. Mary's saying, how can this be? The Lord is with you. Are, are you with me, church? The, the, the Lord is with you. And if you can just celebrate the fact that he is with you, my God, if you don't get one gift under the Christmas tree, you can still be happy. Are you with me, church? If I don't get one gift under the Christmas tree, I'm going to drink coffee and I'm going to be happy. Are you with me, church? Because I know that God is with me. Are you with me, church? He's with us right now, right now, right now. He, he's with us. He's with us. He's with us. Now, that's not just a word for Mary. That's a word for you. Amen. And that's a word for me. Are you with me, church? Amen. Beyond the revelation that the Lord was with Mary, the divine messenger said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So when Mary reached the limits of her imagination about what was humanly possible for her, the angel informed her that the Holy Spirit transcends human limitations. This was a timely word for me because sometimes I'm guilty of emphasizing what I can do. Oh my gosh, I know I'm not the only one. I, I, I say to myself, if I work hard enough, this will happen. If I think creatively enough, this will happen. If I apply myself more, that will happen. But the word from heaven is that my limits are just that. They're limits. But the Holy Ghost does not have limits. And what God is saying to me right now and for the year 2024 is that I have to allow the Holy Ghost to do the heavy lifting. Amen. Oh my gosh, you, I have to let the Holy Ghost do the, 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 the heavy lifting. Uh, you know, what, over the summer, Rakai and I, we were going to the gym. He, he runs track. He's a, he's, a, he's a long jumper and, and a sprinter. And we, we, we would go to uh, Damascus, Damascus Recreation Center, and we, we work out. We, we, I know because you, if you want to be better next year, you got to work out this year. Are, are you with me, church? And, and so, so we would go, we go, and we lift, we lift, we lift. And I, I can tell you, I'm gonna just be honest with you. A lot of times, I did not feel like going. A lot of times, you just you have to make yourself, you have to will yourself into the weight room. Are you with me, church? Because weight is it's hard. It hurts. It makes you sore. But I, I will, I will myself in, into the weight room. Now this is this is what this is what happens. Now now Rakai and I'm not gonna put him on on blast right now, but he's not as strong as I am right now. <laughs> my God. And so 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 when I lift my weight, when I'm done lifting my weight, I have to pull the pin out of two hundred, and I have to put that pin up. I'm not gonna tell him the number. I have to put the pin up. Are you with me, church? Now, as years go on, he will get stronger. But right now, daddy is stronger than him. My God, get it. And, and so, so what happens, what, what, the analogy, the analogy is that sometimes we have to move out of the way. And we've got to allow God to do the heavy lifting. Are you with me? And see, the mistake I've been making, the mistake I've been making is that I've been trying to do the heavy lifting. And you know what it's doing to me? It's wearing me out, church. It's, it's wearing me out because I'm trying, I'm trying to do the heavy lifting and, and I'm not strong enough to do what God can will in my life. Listen, God, God can do what I'm, what I'm wearing myself out to try to do. God can do it in a moment like that. In a moment, God can do it. But you know what God needs from me? God needs me. God needs the humility. This is another disp uh, disposition. This is another character trait. Is that God needs the humility from me to step aside and to say, I, you know what, God, I, I can't. I can't lift it. I've been trying to lift it. I've been trying to lift it. I've been trying to carry it. I've been trying, and the, the, the thing, it won't move. I can't, I can't budget. It won't move. God, I'm going to move aside. I'm going to move aside, and I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you do the heavy lifting. Amen. Are you with me, Charlie? I'm going to let you do the heavy lifting. Now, listen to me. It takes humility. And the thing about Mary was not only fearless in faith, Mary was humble. Oh, my gosh. This is why God, this is why God chose Mary. I'm not talking about duty. I'm talking about disposition. And I think a lot of times, a lot of times we're, we're trying to work ourselves. We're trying to work ourselves into the miracle. 
We're trying to work. We're trying to work ourselves into. And I, don't get me wrong. Duty is important. But but disposition is also important. <laughs> are, are, are you with me? The duty without disposition is a train wreck. Are you with me, church? There's a lot of people doing things and they're not doing it in the right spirit. They're not doing it with the right character. They're not doing it for the right reason. So, so Mary is chosen because of her disposition. And disposition, her, she had humility of character. So she called herself a humble maidservant. Isn't that right? And God is able to use us. So if we step aside Amen. and if we let God do the heavy lifting, listen to me, then we'll experience the miracle working power of God. Are you with me, church? Are you with me, church? Now, 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 this is going to require from me, and this is, this is, this is my mantra for 2024. My mantra is that I have to take on the disposition of humility like Mary and make room for what God can do in my life. Before the angel Gabriel departed from Mary, the messenger gave her one last revelation. And the revelation said, with God, nothing will be impossible. As the divine messenger departed from Mary with this final word, I want to leave you with this last word. I want you to consider all of the impossibles from the year 2023. All of the hopes that were not realized. All of the dreams that were deferred. All of the missed opportunities. We're at the end of the year, so you know what, what has not materialized for you. And as you consider the long list or the short list of impossible things in 2023, I want you to imagine yourself shifting your disposition to one of fearlessness, faith, and humility. I want you, oh, get this, get this, church. I, I, think, I think what God is saying, some of, us, some of us are missing it. It's not because we're not doing the right thing. It's our disposition is wrong. My gosh, I'm not going to miss this one in 2024. My, my disposition, my disposition is wrong. Is that I, have to, I have to believe, I have to have enough faith that, that God can do it even if I can't do it. My gosh, that, that God can do this. See, we reach, I, I feel like in my, in my spiritual journey, I feel like I've reached, I, I peaked early. My God, I, I peaked kind of early. I was young. I was young, and I was, I was, I was put in some really good situations as, as a minister, as a very young, in my 30s, as a, as a young person. And I, I peaked early, and, and sort of sometimes the, 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 the danger of peaking early is that you, you look in the mirror and you say, oh, so what's next? <laughs> so, so God, what am I, what, what am I going, what, what, what am I going to do now? What, what am I going to do now? And we, this is what God is saying. God is saying, listen, God is saying, with, with, with me, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And God is saying, yeah, okay, you did, you did some good things. By God's grace, you did some good things as a young age. But there's some books you can write. <laughs> there's some lectures you can give. There's some universities. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I really don't feel like what I'm saying to you, so don't take it as braggadocia or boasting because I really don't. I'm a substitute teacher right now. I'm telling you, I'm speaking to you the possibilities that are in God. I'm speaking to you from the vantage point of with God, all things are possible. Are, are you with me? All things are possible. And so what God is saying is that, you, okay, so you, you've got, you, it's your disposition. <laughs> I, I know how hard you work. I know how you're writing sermons and you're right. When you get a planning period, you're in your little office writing a sermon for Sunday on a planning period. Now, I know how hard you work. You're doing your duty. You're working hard. You're doing the right thing. It, but God is saying, Sean, check your disposition, though. Check your disposition. That is, that is taking accounting of your faith. It's some, sometimes, sometimes it can be a dangerous thing when all we know is church. I've been in church all my life. <laughs> this one's for me today. If it's for you, take it with you. But this one's for me today. I've been in church all my life. And sometimes when you're in church all your life, you take so many things for granted. You're, you're, you represent a generation of believers that goes back all the way to slavery. You, you're a, in, a gen, in a line. And sometimes we take so many things for granted. And we think that just because... God has to, but God doesn't have to just because God is saying, I need, I need the right disposition for 2024. Amen. And if you, if you can shift, if you can shift, 
If you can shift and say, okay, God, I, I got it. I really need to, I really need to believe that you can do it. I need to believe that all things are, so we say it, we, we say it, and we shout, I can shout right now, just when I say with God, all things are possible, I could just break out in a dance, but the thing is, it's, it's not linguistics, it's a reality of the heart, we really got to, we've got to believe that, that when it looks bad, when it looks like we're at the end of our road, with God, all things are possible. Christmas is not just about a birth narrative. It's about the possibilities of what God can do even when we're on the cross. What he can do with, 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 with destruction and, and with death and with violence and hatred. And God can turn it around. And we, we've got to, you've got to internalize that thing now. It's not just a scripture in the Bible, but it's about your disposition. And you've got to internalize the fact that I can do everything. There's nothing that I can't do. With God, all things are possible. Not one word from God will ever fail. So before, before I cross the threshold into the new year, I'm telling you, I'm going to get myself together. Disposition. Disposition. Humility. Are you with me, church? Faith, fearlessness. You know, one of, the, one of the things, one of the turf monsters that gets me is, I think, fear. I'm, I don't know why I'm going this way today. I'm almost done. It, it, is, it is fear. And sometimes, sometimes it's not the fear of failure that gets me. I think I'm afraid of how successful. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, my Lord. I'm afraid of the success. I'm afraid of the possibility. Are you with me, church? Yeah. I'm afraid. I'm wondering, can I manage? Can I manage what I believe God is putting in my spirit? And I'm afraid of, of the door that will open up. Can I manage? Can I really manage it when God opens the windows of heaven and pours out so much blessings upon me that I do not have enough room to receive it? Can I handle that reality? And God is saying, Sean, you've got to stop being afraid. You've got to stop being, you've got to, you, the disposition is fearlessness. Are you with me? Fearlessness and faith and your humility. And for 2024, this is, this is it. This is my testimony. 2024, I'm shifting my disposition. It's not about duty. It's not just about duty. It's about disposition. Amen. So I'm going to assume the posture today. We're going to pray for everybody. We're going, to, we're going to pray for everybody. And our prayer is that in 2024, that we're going to have the disposition that will accommodate what God wants to, what God wants to birth in us. My God. 